Uh, I'm Peter Marver. I'm a career Wall Streeter. I'm currently a portfolio manager at Aperture Investors and uh, also teach at Harvard University. Uh, David, David Weald, uh, run an investment bank, a new model investment bank called Weald & Co. was vice chairman of NASDAQ. Uh, uh, people call me the father of the Jobs Act for legislative we, legislation we passed down in Washington. And uh, I raised uh, the first money for Larry Fink. And Francis? Okay, I day traded the financial crisis. <laughs> <laughs> and then moved on from there to do a lot of media and talk about economic cycles. And now I am the portfolio strategist and we're allocators. We have about two and a half billion under management. And uh, David. Good morning. I'm David Carter. I serve as the chief investment officer for Lennox Wealth Advisors. We're a registered investment advisor based a few blocks north. And we run uh, multi-asset class portfolio, so equity, fixed income, and alternatives. And I've also indirectly raised some money for Larry. We use <laughs> some of their products. So. I do. Well, I think he's doing okay now, thanks to you. So um, let's go ladies first. Francis, you first. Let's start with the main question. Is it over? If so, why? What do you think? What, do, what are we doing? I mean, you're, not, not, you're not notorious for somewhat being uh, picking the peak in 2007, something we spoke about. Um, I remember losing sleep. A lot of us did. But how, how are you looking now? What do you think? So beginner's luck, no. <laughs> I was actually studying charts that uh, replicated the Great Depression at that time. So it was really actually very interesting to study the top historically while watching it occur in 2007. I will say that I think that the bull market could be over if the Fed is not sensitive to market movements and if the Fed is determined to normalize interest rates and reduce the balance sheet simultaneously and they continue on that trajectory uh, regardless of market movement. And the sim simple reason for that is they're actively reducing the money supply. We have a record amount of debt in the system across all sectors. And that debt, as the interest rates incrementally go up, becomes more difficult to service. So you're putting more pressure on the money supply as debt is becoming more difficult to service. And I think that at some point, it could become challenging for you know, some of the lower rated debt instruments. And well, that, that could create a confidence problem. Confidence. confidence is key. Um, why don't we go with that same question and, and work around the table and then loop back if that works with you, Peter. And if uh, you want to go and go anywhere you want, obviously we can make this, make this a conversation. Yeah. Well, first the question is which which bull market, which country? Because your choice. There's plenty of <laughs> there's plenty of markets all around the world that are actually trading cheaply. Um, you know, we forget that this big dollar rally um, actually has has been been focused mostly in the on uh, US assets so a lot of foreign assets and this year if you look on uh, one of your Bloomberg terminals and you take a look at world markets almost any market outside the US is all going to be red and part of that is because the dollar strength has been so high so the question is like is the dollar you know bull market in that rally over and it and it's tough to say um, because the Fed could be continuing to raise interest rates the US does seem to be the fastest growing not even big economy, even smaller companies, it just happens to be doing really well relative to a lot of other countries around the world. And so until that sort of momentum ends, I'm not sure if the bull market really ends. Will the elections make a key difference? Because last week looked like a potential peak in the dollar. I mean, one thing I like to watch is the U.S. Uh, equity market versus the world. And it's pretty extreme, you know, as far as performance. And it's highly correlated to trade weighted broad dollar. I mean, is there a potential peak maybe with the elections today? Uh, it could be. I mean, um, in our group, we've been thinking that the dollar peaked like a year ago. So been kind of wrong on that because really... Um, uh, well, it did. We're not above the peak from 2000, depending on what measure, not, but close. It depending like the trade rated broad, it's not above it yet. Yeah. The thing yeah. about um, looking at like the dollar value is that often it can stay overvalued or undervalued for years, right? It's never really hanging at uh, a true market weight. It's always either undervalued or overvalued. So, um, and it's, it's looked overvalued for a while, but then again, it could stay that way for, for, for years to come. But sooner or later, there will be a time to kind of get out of the dollar and dollar assets and start to look around the world because certain markets have just gotten very, very cheap. I mean, if we look at even just something like the Chinese stock market, it's amazing to look at how the U.S market has gone up and the Chinese market got now almost the inverse, right, over the last couple of years. So, I mean, there's definitely cheap markets out there. Yeah, no, I would, I would agree with that. We run, we tend to run a global equity portfolio, so U.S. and non-U.S. equities, and we look a lot at the relative valuation between U.S. and non-U.S. equities. And I think if you just think about one data point, I, I think 
call it, ESO, call it develop non-US markets, trades at about 90% historically of the S&P multiple. And I think today it's down around 80% of the multiple. Yeah, emerging so, markets are down to maybe 60, 65%, yeah. right? So I, they're also traditionally cheaper than where they normally are. They're always exactly, cheap, but yeah. they're it, actually cheaper. Exactly, now. yeah, yeah. So. David, we mentioned China. I, I expect you have an opinion. Maybe we can go there a little bit with you and maybe talk about jobs. Well, and, well I, think, yeah. I, think, I, think, I think governmental policy is in a transformational stage right now. And uh, um, the, um, I, I, did a, I did a series of interviews recently to keynote a conference and uh, spoke to the, one, of the, one of the former heads of the uh, uh, chief, chief uh, national, uh, national security advisor to Trump, I spoke to a head of global trade uh, for Obama, and uh, I think universally there's a view in Washington, or a growing view, that the, that, uh, that the Chinese and the pilfering of technology and everything is a real issue to contend with. And if you have uh, seen some of the legislation that went through, including CFIUS, which is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, uh, they um, are now going to start looking at, uh, at minority stakes in companies. And so, You've got 200,000 uh, Chinese that have been systematically engaging in industrial espionage, working for China, 25% of US STEM students, science, technology, engineering, and math in the gra on the graduate level are from China. There is a massive wave of investing in, in early stage uh, 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 technology companies. That's where all the Chinese, it's not later stage, it's free peaks of technology. And they've been forcing shifts uh, or transfers of technology into joint ventures. And so, you know, if it, and I, if, when I talk to the Democrats that were involved in the in the sec, in the in the in, with commerce, I mean, they believe that when Trump Trump had that one Chinese company with 75,000 em, em, uh, employees on the mat, that they should have bankrupted the company for stealing technology instead of capitulating to Z. And so I think that whether it's Democrats or Republicans, I mean, Jeff Sessions just indicted uh, in the Department of Justice two people uh, from. Uh, I, I think it was Taiwan or Singapore, I'm not sure which. I mean, we're getting, we're seeing, uh, we're getting FBI calls now from, on the investment banking side, uh, you know, rattling the cage of some of the Chinese that are, you know, that are coming through the market. And so I think that, that there's sort of a universal view within Washington that this is a problem. And, and, you know, so when you look at trade wars and things like that, that's sort of a, one of those things that could surprise people, I think, a little bit, and it could get worse before it gets better. And by the way, the, the, the Democrats will tell you that, you know, what they don't like about what China, they, they applaud the fact that China, that, that, that Trump, the Trump administration actually has engaged China. What they don't like is, is engaging on, on multiple fronts because they see that the Europeans, as their allies, have the same problem with China and that we'd be better off tackling that problem together. And so I think, this, to bring it home, this, this could be, you, you could actually see higher costs as a function of trade wars get out of hand, okay, so you're, which would put, would be recessionary, if you will, at the same time it'll also be inflationary, so you could get a double whammy on, on I, I, uh, I guess prices I guess the key question stocks. is, is it could or should, is this happening and is it going to get worse compared to where we are now, and, and might that change a little bit today? With the election, you know, it, it, the, the Chinese have been engaged in a, in a in a trade war with the United States for over 20 years, and we're just starting to come around to it. So the question is, are they going to get back? Are they going to start coming into international norms of behavior? You just look at what happened in the South China Sea with them building military bases on atolls to kind of project out force and so on and so forth. And so this is starting to become uh, something that occupi occupies a lot of a lot of uh, gray matter down in D.C. And I was down in Congress, went around, I mean, the House Oversight Committee, everybody is focused on this right now. It's, uh, the, by the way, the CFIUS legislation, they, they still have to promulgate rules on that, so we don't know exactly how that's going to play out in the marketplace, but, it, but, but there's a move in that direction. Does anyone want to expand on that, going to the China route here at all in this trade war? And, yeah. Yeah, perhaps the one comment I might make is, is understandably after October, a lot of clients said, hey, hey, gee, Dave, what went wrong? You know, our, why did equity sell off so much? You know, our view, it wasn't really because of decelerating profit growth. It wasn't really because of rates were starting to tick up. The real issue was the uncertainty created around the tariffs. And you saw some of that, you know, if company XYZ announced earnings a few weeks ago, if it was our input, input costs just went up, so our profits are going down. I think those tended to be the ugliest days in the market. So I'm a little unhappy to hear you say this trade tiff may take a long time to get solved because 
at least for in our opinion, it's a key key driver. It's one of the biggest drivers of equity markets today. Um, one key thing I want to oh, do you no, have confidence in it? I yeah. wonder if the trade war continues, or if it gets if it makes the markets you know hugely more volatile, if the Fed will change their trajectory in raising interest rates based upon that. So that's yeah, another sort that's of a, maybe the discussion I enjoy with you. I always look at the Fed as being an ex-bond trader. It's the number one thing to stop them from tightening is the equity market going down. Imagine if we were down as much as China, they'd be clamoring for easing and. But one thing I want to go to, unless there's any more comments on that similar subject, I want to kind of twist a little bit um, to the next subject. Peter, the, the, you, the, there's you. one thing that I, I should share with folks is that that the Chinese government um, is of the mind, and the, and, this, and our government knows this, that the reason why the United States dominated the last century was because of our leadership in technology. Okay, that's all you need to know, and so sort of the, you know they are hyper focused on not letting that move to China. And so it's going to have some broad implications for how the government, you know, moves along. Trump is very concerned about job numbers. He's very concerned about economic growth. And so I think you've got a really, you know, sort of delicate dance that's going on there. They don't want to be, you know, too overly aggressive. But the flip side is, is I don't think that they want to compromise uh, loss of U.S. technology to the Chinese any longer. One other quick point about China, and maybe I would ask you this question, is if Trump has come out and said, we are going to officially put tariffs on 100 percent, well, you can't go up from there. It's 100 percent. So can you price that in quite easily and assume that that's going to decrease the volatility? Or, Well, I, I think that it, as the risk goes up, you're going to start to see a lot of, you know, I, w I would think, a lot of manufacturing movement away from China, right? And uh, people are going to look for, you know, make sure that they have second and tertiary sources if they're you know, you also got a bigger risk around supply chain. I mean, there's I was one of the guys that I talked to, you know, get ready for this speech was a, was the head of government relations at U.S. Steel. And you know, on the one hand, uh, the head of government relations, I mean, the head of, head of, uh, of uh, global trade for Obama would tell me that there are, are two million jobs that are created from cheap steel and only 50,000 jobs created from the manufacture of steel. But the problem is, is that a lot of what they've been going after systematically was to erode U.S. Uh, defense and national security by going after certain specialty steel manufacturers where the steel was important to save, for instance, the hulls of submarines. So there's a whole logistic component to it and sort of beyond my pay grade to really kind of suss out what all of that is, but there's no question that they're looking at the logistical aspect of this too, increasingly. And if you go right now, I mean, people, I was down in Panama not that long ago, and uh, you know, the, the, the Panamanians will effectively tell you that the Chinese are in control of the Panama Canal now. So. But one thing I was struck by being in London last week is what you said, you know, I was there before the election and the animosity for Trump was shocking, but the amount of people who really think, thank you, you're finally beaten on the Chinese where well, they've been killing us. The Germans, they don't want to export anything because they kill it, they take, steal our intellectual property and stuff. I was impressed with the amount of people told me that at high levels, that this is something we've been waiting for. They might not like his tactics, but hey, it's working, at least in that way. One thing I wanted to go on into a little bit is the main thing, outlook, is we, we hear, okay, it's an extended bull market, um, unemployment's low, it's great, I have a kid in college who wants to go next year, I'm like, get out now, market's hot, but no, you know, typical student. Um, what would be the main drivers to stop this bull? If, I mean, we're focusing on China, I mean, a year from now, what should be our, our subject? I look at it as it's a mean reversion year, and simplistically, I look at it, what we did in 2007, the VIX dropped to the lowest ever, I'm like, all right, that's my signal. This year, last year, it was the lowest ever, ever, you know, 30 years, so, okay, that's my signal, say, Mark volatility those mean reverts starting to go up. Now, that's me. So, um, Peter, maybe we should start with you and group, sure. uh, go back and anybody comment? Any you like? You know, well, first of all, we have to remember that the U.S. stock markets have reset a lot since January of this year. So, if you look at PEs right now, I think, you know, trailing PEs in the S&P are under 19, I think uh, under 24 on the NASDAQ. I mean, these are not crazy, crazy by historical standards. If you look at emerging markets, we're down to, I don't know, about 12, um, relatively low. So, you know, in that respect, you, you might not want to say that stock markets in the U.S. or globally are necessarily uh, overvalued. I think I would disagree with Warren Buffett, who looks at the, I think, market cap relative to GDP and says it's been 
inflated, you know, and for for years. Um, I think actually, like that, that's not necessarily the best measure. I think PEs are a good measure of just value. I think where you might say the bull market is over, it might be in the bond market, um, right? I think everybody on the panel would probably agree that you know we don't see interest rates going down and credit spreads in 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 many um, U.S. categories are already at kind of like all-time tights or very close to their tights. So I would say, you know. The stocks still could have some room to run, certainly around the world. Bonds, probably a different question. That, to me, looks like the heyday might be over. So, uh, underweight, overweight? Uh, I mean, I look at it, okay, it's been a dip in the market, and are we supposed to just say, oh, thank you, reallocate back to overweight? Um, and put a stop in, I suppose. Maybe, Francis, you'd be better on the stop, cause it seems like you're more the trader. <laughs> yeah, put a stop in. Um, Peter, what I like about what you said was that the markets have reset, and we look at the P.E. ratios, and they are not crazy at the moment. However, what did it take to get there? It took so many iterations of quantitative easing, and now we're quantitative tightening. So if those, nor if those normal P.E. ratios after the financial crisis are dependent upon quantitative easing, and quantitative tightening reverses that, I would say that that's where there's something unique in the system that could make them a little bit vulnerable. But I also think what you said earlier about emerging markets being cheap, I think I see people flooding into other areas if U.S. looks a little tenuous because of the trade wars or the Fed, et cetera. I think your, 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 your timing is interesting, and, and we didn't do this because I was sitting on a panel, but just this morning, uh, we took up our equity allocation across all portfolios, and a lot of it was valuation-driven. If you just look at where the where U.S. markets trade relative to itself, it, it looks certainly within reason. If you look at non-U.S. markets, they look cheap relative to themselves and relative to the U.S. I think our biggest concern, uh, again, is the, the China trade war or the TIF or the uncertainty. And I guess my only hope there is that if it gets bad enough, it'll be very detrimental to certainly China, certainly to the U.S., and arguably the rest of the world. Right. And you'd hope there's two bigger folks in the room that say, let's come to some sort of solution. I mean, That's the, the odd, hope. The odd thing is I, I think it'll be a lot, I mean, personally, if I was in charge, but I think it'd be a lot worse for China than the United States. And uh, I mean, and you know, we are always the beneficiary of flight capital and un uncertainty, so you'd then get a dollar rally. So, you know, in some regards, uh, I, I, I think that they, I mean, I was really kind of surprised when Trump took his, you know, his, his foot off, I think it was SDE, and they could have easily bankrupted that company, and I think that it just showed that he's trying to, you know, be somewhat reasonable and try and negotiate uh, a stand. But, you know, when you, when you run into the numbers of, of people in the U.S. market, Chinese, that I have, that are, you know, and the way that they, they, they deal with this technology poaching, is they, they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily working for the government. The government just says, we're only going to allow you to get money out of China to invest in technology, early stage technology. So people come, and I had, uh, I had actually uh, one woman that uh, put me on a blockchain uh, panel, and who had been over here. I mean, it's just an anecdote, but it sort of tells you what's going on. Was for, uh, came over to Canada to learn English when she was 14 years old, and I and, and I and I asked her, you know, what her parents did for a living, and it turns out that her father is the senior naval commander in the uh, Sea of Japan. Okay, so I don't think that this stuff is, uh, you know, is is accidental. I I think that, you know, it's going to be pretty. It's, yeah, it's going to be, and it's going to get rocky. I mean, you know, this stuff spreads slowly, and you've got the FBI on it now. You've got uh, the Department of Justice and Sessions is looking at it. Trump is looking at it. The congressmen are actually, you know, hearing about it. And uh, I think that we were kind of uh, asleep at the switch, frankly, for an awful long time, and people are understanding the many layers of this sort of, if you will, incursion into you know, our sovereignty and the poaching that's going on. And I, I just don't think that our government is going to let it stand. Is what I'm, what, what, happens, uh, what happens if the Democrats take both the House and the Senate today? Do you think things would turn? No. I, 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 th I think that, uh, honestly, I mean, I mean the friend, friend of mine, literally, he ran global trade for, for Obama. And he was a bigger hawk when I talked to him about this than, uh, than, uh, uh, than the Republicans that I've spoken to. And so I, I think that there is sort of, you know, it was, you know at, at a senior level, I mean, there is, there is real concern. You know, you, you just need to go back, um, you know, in time and look at the Manhattan Project and why we won the Second World War. You know, it was technology. And in that particular case, you know, if you look at, 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 uh, 
at immigration. I mean, we were we had we had essentially had an open door policy for some of the greatest physicists of 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 of, of Western and Eastern Europe. Right, Einstein came from there. I mean, uh, Enrico Fermi. I mean, these were people that were involved in that. And so, you know, until we have a little bit of an uh, you know an epiphany in regards to our immigration policies and understand what's at stake, and maybe this is in the offing. I, I think we still have some vulnerabilities, but it, the march is definitely in the direction of trying to finally, you know, contend with 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 this risk, and it, it's a significant risk. But that said, net net, if 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 it gets a little ugly, I think we end up being at least a short-term beneficiary of the ugliness, you know. So you think the equity markets? So from your sort of internal perspective and speaking with all of these people, you think that the equity markets are going to benefit from this ultimately? Do you think that in the short term? you'll have increased volatility for the equity markets based on this? Or do you think is a long-term benefit? What no. do you think the time, well, I mean, not to ask you to time anything, we don't do that, right? We, we never time markets. Yeah. No. <laughs> but I mean, when, it, when there's a lot of saber rattling and uncertainty, there's no question it creates volatility and there'll be a sell-off over a short period of time. But at some point there's a recalibration and if it gets really, really uncomfortable, people will bring, bring uh, you know, convert currencies into dollars and the, do and, the, and the cash coming into the market will cause the market to, how do you think no. the Fed will react, and what do you think? Do you how much pressure do you think that Trump can put on the Fed to sustain the economic growth through the volatility of China? Uh, I, I like that. Go, is that a, uh, he's got a bully, he has a bully, like he has a bully pulpit, I mean, but yeah. the Fed is independent, and I think that. Uh, I mean, I, my, my feeling is is that most of them sort of, you know, uh, smile, you know, kindly, and then do what they're planning on doing. I don't think they respond too much to. That kind of pressure. I remember reading I the think book. The Fed is much, much less concerned with Trump's tweets than the PCE deflator. You know, yeah. <laughs> tell me what inflation does, and that's what the Fed's going to do. Mm -hmm. I think and hope. So, was anybody on this panel worried about inflation? I, I, I am because I, I think it often stems from uh, labor market tightness, and finally we all get brave enough to ask for for rage, uh, way, uh, raises. And I think you're starting to see some increase in wage costs. And I think, it, I'm not sure how good the data is, but if you look at the, the labor market, boy, it looks really tight. You know, my wife still doesn't have a job, but it still looks really, really tight. So I think the data would suggest the labor market is so tight that sooner or later wages start to rise. But I don't know the data well enough to know if, well, the participation rate is too low, so there's plenty of slack there. But, but that's what I... You, you have baby boomers coming out of the market retiring, right? So when you look at the number of jobs that are created, I mean, we used to do, you know, we, we used to think a bull market, you go back to the 90s, I mean, in terms of, of, of uh, job, job increases, was 400,000 a year. Now we're doing backflips over 250,000 because the demographics have completely and completely changed. So, you know, that that takes demand out of the out of the, the consumptive side of the market with people retiring, right? They're not buying cars and houses, they're downsizing and that that has a little bit of a, a deflationary uh, element to it. And so, you know, it, 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 I, I think it becomes really tricky, you know, because we still haven't, I mean, it's sort of the question, we haven't seen a lot of wage Absolutely. labor inflation yet and that may have something to do with it. Yeah, well, some people argue that the population in general, the working age, is getting older. There are a lot more older people working uh, than there used to be. And those people are not that interested in always asking for raises. You know, that, that they're coming in, actually they're downsizing like in their careers and are willing to kind of take less and maybe just work part time and things like that. Um, in fact, I think you guys read an article today about how um, over 65 year old folks were we're I saw that, replacing yeah. high school students uh, at fast food restaurants and sort of low-end jobs. Yeah. So that could keep the, uh, a lid on, on, on wage inflation. I'm not that worried about inflation because I, I think that the Fed is watching inflation carefully and I think that we risk a little bit of an overcorrection. It depends on, for me, it depends on the rate that they reduce the balance sheet. And initially that is inflationary, but it's ultimately deflationary. It, it exists on a curve because you're physically removing the money supply. And I actually think there's enough debt in the system that um, we, we may see a problem there. And that's going to you know, get rid of any kind of inflationary concerns, a little bit like the financial crisis. And I actually asked myself, Peter, you're going to disagree with me. I'm ready for that. No. I actually asked myself if we're at the top of the V and a W. Because of basically, we did have to have quantitative easing to get out of the financial crisis. So in essence, we did paper over some problems that could be coming in the face of tightening 
in a record year of you know, reducing the money supply, so yes. We need a good disagreement. Peter, you wanna go for that one? Well, Come on. I, I actually, I'm not gonna disagree with you oh because- Oh my God, I'm so excited. So I will bring something up because uh, we haven't heard anybody, I haven't heard anybody at least during this conference talk about the twin deficits, that people don't talk about it, but our trade deficit continues to grow at a record level and we also have these massive fiscal deficits and there is gonna be a, a day of reckoning for this. Um, people haven't talked about it just yet, but when they do, you know, normally confidence starts to change and you do see uh, uh, stocks normally hit during that kind of period. I think that's also about the question about the dollar, right? Like people will start to question the value of the dollar when they start focusing on these deficits, but for right now, you know, nobody seems to be caring too much. I wonder why that is. David, you like you wanted to go there. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I uh, guess uh, as it relates to say the twin deficit, deficit or, actually, or at least the fiscal deficit, uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I've probably spent about two minutes thinking about the midterm elections because I'm not sure it really matters. I think, you know, if you if you if you have the status quo where the Republicans are in both parties, you know, some folks might say, oh, great, tax cut 2.0 and an infrastructure bill, and we're going to more stimulus. We can't. <laughs> I think the 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 health of the fiscal balance sheet is kind of precarious. And I think cooler heads will prevail there and say, tax cut 2.0 is not happening. So I think it's kind of irrelevant there. And I think if the Democrats surprisingly sweep, that Trump is too big of a target uh, for impeachment. So that's just going to be a, a mess where I think a lot of people in DC just kind of do but you certainly wouldn't get You certainly wouldn't get the tax cut. You wouldn't get the tax cut even if they just take the House. There's probably a... Correct. So, so part of my view is it, it, it's... I, I, so I, we rally from here. <laughs> right? Regardless, we find a reason to rally. If the Democrats go in, we you, could rally. That's if, if you uh, presume that there's a mechanical understanding of the debt and the taxes. I don't think that there is, based on the fact that the tax cuts created a parabolic movement in January. But um, this is the analogy I always use for people when I'm trying to explain to them if they're not investors, okay? Um, it's like a swimming pool and the Fed is draining and it's slowly, slowly draining the water and Trump's got the fiscal fire hose. And the fiscal fire hose, while it's elevating things currently, is not sustainable, you know, yeah. for exactly yeah. the reasons that David pointed out, the Davids. Uh, the Davids. So um, my thought is that maybe we should um, see if there's any questions, get a pulse for the audience, any potential questions for our panelists from the audience? Anyone? Okay, I think we have a little more time. Ryan, are you there? How much time do we have? 15 minutes, cool. So one thing I wanted to go to a little bit is I always looked at, you know, being in markets, trading pits since the 80s, technologies, boom, push that away, gone. Then I came, I was a voice broker here in, in, in New York since in the early 90s, and poof, that's gone. I mean, that's part of this reason for this conference is technology is just moving so fast. So I look at, like, a lot of our focus is on the trade war. And I look at, always looked at, if you were an alien and you came to the world and you wanted to sell, buy, or sell anything, where would you go? Would, you're going to go probably the United States. 50 continuous states, rule of law, a lot of people making a lot of money, and, you know, you generally can. And I heard that in, in Europe a lot. I met a lot of young people, and I heard I was from New York. I said, oh, I want to go to New York, you know, because they hear unemployment's, what is it? 3.9 or something like that, it's pretty low. So my, my thought is in this trade wars, how could we if lose? If they can get a visa. Yeah, well, right. that's the thing, they can't, but I mean, my family of immigrants, you know, we all are. My mother's first thing was Lithuanian. But um, how could we lose the trade war? Meaning, I, I look at it as political. I'm from the Midwest and it plays really well. China bashing, certainly from people who are sick of seeing made in China in their products. And, and they might not be right, but it plays so well, and Trump just figured it out. His advisors, he, I think he was smart enough to take their advice. And he, he's been doing what he said. So, I mean, how do we go there? How is this going to plan out a year from now? What's, you know, it seems like the predominant theme right now. Uh, one thing that people don't talk about too much is that probably half of our trade deficit is really with Japan and Germany and, and the rest of Europe, right? And we don't seem to be having any more trade war rhetoric with the Europeans or Japanese. So the question is whether, you know, uh, as a tactic, Trump would try to get some deal with the Japanese and Europeans, considering that I think your, your, the, the, the concern over China and technology transfer is not just an American concern. I think it is a global concern. Um, and obviously, you know, if we could get the Europeans and the Japanese on board, we've already got the, 
the NAFTA deal done, it might create some kind of momentum and some global pressure, you know, to, to really isolate the Chinese. David, I mean, that was, it could be a little wishful both, both thinking are get you as an American. That. No, but that was what Obama's head of global trade said. I mean, it, you know, that, that you know, fought, fighting trade wars on multiple fronts wasn't, you know, wasn't that constructive. It might play well in swing states, and it might help Trump get reelected, but, it, but, but what was really important was technology and technology theft and technology leadership and and that we have much more in common in that regard with the Germans, with the Japanese, with the rest of Western Europe. We we face a common threat. And so, you know, the right way in his he argued with me was to pursue this trade war was really more one that was unilateral getting meeting between uh, the West and and Japan and China and get China to get the China problem fixed because he saw that as potentially over the long run the real existential threat. To put a sharp yeah. point on it, I think. I think if I'm not mistaken, I think as part of the trade deal with Canada and Mexico, I think there was a clause in there that basically said, you know, dear Mexico, you cannot enter into a side deal with any non-open countries, which was basically you can't do your own deal with China. You know, you, you, your deal is with us. So I think it speaks exactly to your point where it's, let's all gang up. Well, this is, this is the thing that, uh, you know, the head of U.S. Steel, as a government relations office, pointed out to me. They call it transshipping, right? And, and uh, there's a term for, you know, how is it that South Korea ends up shipping more steel to the United States or to Western countries than it actually produces? And the answer is, is because China's producing it, and they then turn it into... South Korean steel, and it gets shipped out, and they avoid uh, 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 tariffs that way. And uh, so I think they're, you know, they're getting progressively more sophisticated about um, about origin, and uh, uh, they probably have a lot of work to do in that area. But you know, bit by bit, um, they they seem to be at least on the on the chase, whittling whittling it, whittling the problem down. Well, we're doing that a little bit with soybeans now. It's kind of a little more my focus. In Brazil, they're th what, the highest ever versus U.S., so there's getting, they're getting to China, but indirectly. So I guess that's the point with free trade, which is kind of an oxymoron if it's true, is at least you don't have – it's fair. It's, it, you know, the, the winners the, – who, who benefits the most in that certain – whatever product that it should do the best. But I always like to say it's kind of like um, the quote I always hear from the Chinese, oh, we're benefits, of, everybody says, yes, we're advocates of free trade as long as we're running trade surpluses with the US. That's the sense I always got. That's true. <laughs> I mean, they say it, but it's, come on, it's not fair. There's an, a knockoff version of Bloomberg in China. I've heard about it. I mean, like, okay, well, that's kind of, rule of law should prevail. They should crack down on that, like you mentioned. It should be, that's gotta happen, I would think, at some point. <laughs> I think one of the big political issues, and I'm stepping a little outside of my normal. <laughs> Please. But um, I think one of the big political issues is, okay, so we saw that there were some consequences to outsourcing a lot of the manufacturing to China, right? There were a lot of consequences. Um, now, Trump wants to make America great again, and he wants to bring in back coal, steel, and all of these things, right? And so, obviously, people who were displaced by that find that very hopeful, and that makes complete sense. And then, you know, that they're... they're sort of the opposing political parties are like, let's move forward, let's do new technologies, let's do new energy, let's do this. So I think that there's, um, and I don't know how practical that is, honestly, um, with people that were trained in what they were trained in, and I don't know, you know, I'm not really sure that I have a vote yet, I'm just sort of a, an observer, but I think it's very interesting politically, and I think it's gonna be hard to move any one of those things forward if the Democrats, you know, do win the majority in the House or the majority in the House and the Senate, and there's a bit of a gridlock. There's no momentum in either direction. Well, that was a sense I got in London from traders um, and commodities. And so now we're we've subject to being traders one tweet at a time. And they have to be careful. Any position they have on the one tweet, like in soybeans, boom, they popped up 5% last week from one little tweet. So... Uh, can I ask Peter a question? Please, let's do that. He's Come on. Let me get out of the way. I mean, you know, making making the case for better values offshore. So obviously, looking at international and emerging growth markets, emerging markets. Um, you know, we've got. If you look at south of the border now, right? We've got we've got Venezuela as a, a failed state, right? And you worry about what the knock-on effects of that's going to be in the region. I mean, when I was down in Panama, they told me that there were 70,000 Venezuelans in Panama. It's only a country of three million people. We have. Uh, and then you look at the, you know, the, the, the whole caravan problem now, which is El Salvador, Honduras, and uh, Guatemala 
are all kind of failed states in their own right, right? And so, you know, is this, how do you look at that? Because obviously if you don't stabilize the region, you're gonna have more caravans, more of a refugee crisis in this direction, okay? And at the same time, you wonder, how is that gonna spill over and impact economics in the region? Yeah, well, I think we always fail to sort of put the size of countries, you know, in a perspective. Because really, if you look at all of Central America, it's just they're tiny compared to, let's say, Mexico, you know, which is over 130 million people. You've got over 150 million people in uh, Brazil. Uh, Venezuela is 30-odd million people. It's one of the bigger ones, but it's a long way from, from, from you know, Caracas to Miami or even to the Rio Grande. So I don't, I don't think we'll have those kind of real big spillover effects. And we also forget that really the big economic engine in the world is not Latin America uh, or, or even Europe anymore, right? It's all out in Asia. And out there, you know, China is the second largest economy in the world, and it's still growing at whatever it is, five, six percent. And you're talking about a, a 12 or 13 trillion dollar economy, and that's adding a few hundred billion dollars of growth uh, into the world. You've got trillion dollar plus economies in place like India. You've got South Korea, which I think is the 12th or 13th largest economy in the world, let alone Japan, which is still one of the, I mean, there's still like a load of economic activity going on outside of the US. And I know that the US has been the game for the last couple of years, but eventually that game ends. And I remind people that, you know, people thought the that emerging markets were all the basket cases uh, 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 in the late 90s and even early 2000s. And then between 2002 and 2007, the emerging market equity index went up 400%. So, and that was after a long period where the dollar was really, really strong. So I always feel like, right, when the dollar's the strongest, it's probably just about the time you need to start to consider some of these foreign markets. We have um, a few minutes, Any, and just making sure before we finish up, I, I think we have a question. Sir. Uh, you, can, you can repeat it to him, unless you can grab the mic, sure. One second. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question is, um, the growth is coming from the technology companies. And um, KPCB says top 20 growth technology companies, 11 are in US, nine are in China. And so therefore, to what extent this uh, China bashing, I'm not you know, being critical or one way or other, is gonna affect um, the, the bull which is coming from the technology growth companies which almost all of them uh, need some kind of a network effects. And um, so nine of them are in China, 11 in US, and they're growing um, you know, in India, in ASEAN countries, and so on and so forth. What is the, in your opinion, um, and, and maybe I'm talking to uh, David Will here, in your opinion from a NASDAQ experience perspective, uh, this kind of, um, foreign um, strategy uh, will impact uh, the technology companies, the top 20 growth companies? Uh, it's a good question. I, um, you know, I haven't done any analysis, I, but I'm aware of you know, the, the fact that in, in China, a lot of certainly American network-based you know, companies are really not that prevalent in the Chinese market. And for anti-competitive reasons as much as anything, and then vice versa. I mean, a lot of, because the United States generally led in the development of the, these uh, network technologies, and they were you know, copied. We also, by the way, we exported our uh, venture capital industry to China. I mean, they, for a long time, I mean, a lot of US venture funds had a, had a stake in the ground, trained Chinese, set up the venture industry over there, and then the Chinese you know, uh, venture capital partners broke away and started their own funds, right? So, and we kind of trained them on, on how to do it. But, you know, they, there's been a history of, of taking things that have been tried in the U.S. markets and putting a Chinese spin and launching, obviously, I mean, Alibaba being a case in point, Amazon being the precursor, right? Uh, so, but I, I don't know that the trade war per se is going to affect a lot of our network companies, because I just don't think they're that embedded in China, but there are companies that have supply chain issues, notably Apple, right? 
And so I don't, I mean, my guess is, is that Apple's probably watching this, Steve Cook is, and they're trying to figure out, you know, how to insulate themselves to some degree against this sort of a trade war, at least they should be. But um, we're, we're running out of time. I was wondering if we can just do final words from each of you. If um, you want to, Peter, you want to, any thoughts or thinking things to leave our audience with for they can pin us down on uh, for next year? I can start off. I'm, I looked at the equity market at the beginning of this year. It's, it's way overdue for a period of underperformance, and my main signal was the VIX. Boom. Simple. Yours. <laughs> uh, well, I think that the U.S. stock markets have paused, I, but it wouldn't surprise me if, if the, the bull market continued. Um, but I wouldn't take my eye off some of these foreign markets that I think really are very, very cheap. I expect U.S. equity returns to be sort of middling, uh, nothing to write home about, and I think they're vulnerable to a shock. And uh, uh, you know, I would agree that some of that capital might choose other markets uh, if they're cheaper. Uh, uh, you know, in order to in order to seek out returns, so I, I I think there's there's more downside than there is upside at this particular point in time. Francis. The Fed, the Fed, the Fed. No, <laughs> I think the rate of quantitative tightening, and I think confidence in the sort of intermingling issues of these trade wars and different news items, um, and how those sort of hit each other simultaneously, I think will make a big difference. I think if the Fed is, um, you know, not data dependent and the equity markets rock a little bit and they continue on their trajectory, it could make some of the debt markets a little bit weak. Um, also, they're tightening, you know, we're the first to tighten and they're tightening on a latent time period um, globally. So I would see us, if the tightening continues to move out of U.S. and a little bit more into, as you say, some of the cheaper foreign markets. So. David, I think you need to borrow a mic there. Yes, yeah, you thanks can have so much. I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, I've been managing portfolios for about 20 years, and I don't think there has ever been a single day where I've walked into the office and said, hey, great, i got nothing to worry about today. There's always, always uncertainty in markets. U.S., non-U.S., rates, inflation, you name it. So while it might feel like, oh, geopolitics is crazy today, I I'm not sure it's, it's really that much more significant relative to the past. So. So I think we're getting the best hook we can. You all smell that food. We're between us and food. I want to thank Beryl Eats for having us and my panelists, and I really appreciate the conversation. Get me out of the way. And I want to make two nominations that I think my nominations, we've had the best content, the best quality people, and number one, we're the best dressed. Has there Absolutely been any bad panel bad. with four gentlemen with suits on and a lady with a dress on? Has there been any? I mean, at crypto conferences, you get hoodies. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate it.